Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for taking time out on a Tuesday afternoon to attend this uh, Leeds Digital Festival um, webinar. Um, my name is Neil Briscoe. I'm the CTO and co-founder of uh, Cloud Gateway. Uh, we're a hybrid cloud connectivity and security platform as a service. Bit of a mouthful, but it's effectively um, we bridge uh, legacy networks to the cloud with security wrappers and loads of other stuff. Anyway, this webinar today, uh, we're discussing some practical options and uh, reference architecture for uh, future business continuity. Um, with, with the advent of uh, what happened earlier on this year with COVID-19, uh, there was a mass drive to um, work from home. Uh, things sprung up on us, um, whether we liked it or not. And regardless of how you plan your data centers and your IT infrastructure and your services, it never really catered for 100% uh, CP, 100% uh, utilization um, throughout. So what I'm going to do today is look at some architectures of how to use cloud for your business continuity. Now, that could be business continuity as a service, um, disaster recovery, or just simply future-proofing and augmenting your existing um, enterprise, but using cloud. So what I'm going to do is hopefully everybody can see this page here. We're not going to do um, PowerPoint karaoke. It's going to be interactive, and I'm going to start drawing and explaining a few things. So let's start. Remove that and have this back. So I'm going to split this into two sections. Is number one is it's all well and good of uh, everybody saying, well, yeah, take these services in the cloud, use use cloud to augment your existing infrastructure. Um, and I, I've been in networking for nearly 25 years now, and networking is the unsung hero. It's not particularly a sexy thing, but it's absolutely mandatory for getting everything to work. So what I'm going to do in part one is explain all the different, uh, well, three architectures and processes that you can go through to connect your existing estate to the cloud, and then uh, and pros and cons of each. And then I'm, <coughs> excuse me, going to describe once you've got connectivity to cloud uh, for your business continuity, um, what technologies we can use within the cloud and the pros and cons uh, of them. So I'm going to move on to this board. I'm not being ignorant you'll see the side of my head while I'm drawing. So number one, we're going to discuss on how we connect to cloud. And I'm going to talk you through three, three ways. And when I talk about cloud, I'm talking about the public services offerings that are out there. Uh, so AWS, Google, uh, Microsoft Azure, etc. It's the same for all of them, same principles for all of them. If I draw an AWS rather than Azure, please don't be offended. It's just the way that I, I draw things out. So this is your estate down here. You could have a WAN with multiple sites hanging off of that, and you may have a data center there. And you may be connecting out to the internet to that data center. Um, previously, you may have had, I don't know, some VPN services here, so users out on the road would VPN on the client and get into your estate that way. But what we found with, with COVID, um, and we, we were tasked with trying to get um, up to 30,000 NHS workers working from home, is that, number one, the VPN RAS client infrastructure wasn't really scalable to having people working from home. Not everybody had a corporate device to work from home, and you're putting pressure on your infrastructure from your data center. So methods to connect to cloud. Say, for example, over here, You've gone with AWS and you've got the VPC there. And that natively is connected to the internet. So method number one of connections to augmenting your estate into the cloud is a simple VPN. So the likeliness is you'll have a router or a firewall here. And if you spin up an AWS VPC or any sort of cloud, there will be a, a, met, a method of connecting, normally called VGWs or uh, VPN gateways. And effectively what it does is they will provide you a config and you just do a simple site-to-site -site VPN across there. With AWS and Azure, you can actually download the config and you say, hey, here, I've got a Cisco router. What do I need to configure on there so that I can connect back to my IaaS? And you can cut and paste the config on there. Benefits of this 
is that this is augmented and it's an extension of your data center. So say for example, you might have a network up there that it will be fully routable from your WAN. So this PC down on your WAN would traverse the network and get to there. Because it's not connected to the internet outbound, you've got a, a VPN tunnel that connects and all it's doing is extending your data center out to the cloud. Benefits of this is it's extremely quick. You can set up this VPN in five or 10 minutes um, from, your, from your data center. It's basically bring your own network. You're levering your existing internet. You're leveraging your existing devices out there. And the AWS fabric, that's all AWSs. You don't have to cater for that. So it's quick. It's bring your own network. So those are the pluses. Minuses is that there is no SLA. As you're traversing the internet, it's a free-for-all. It's not a private circuit. Uh, it's as good as your internet circuits that you've got here. The availability within cloud providers is extremely high. 10 nines, 11 nines, whatever you want it to be, really. Um, but there's no SLA on there, so you're at the, um, at the mercy of what the internet is. Um, on, on, the, on the downside as well, with that, with the no SLA, there's sort of no performance guarantees on that is that, again, you're at the mercy of the internet and how quickly you can transfer that <coughs> data. But we see people use this as a tactical measure that they want to start building services out in their cloud fabric that don't want to do it on your data center campus. You want to start extending and augmenting. It's a very, very quick way to effectively give you the size of AWS or Azure connected to your fabric seamlessly. So that is scenario number one is simple IPSEC site-to-site -site VPN from your estate to the cloud. Next one is the next sort of level above this. It's not showing through. That's good. So we'll start again down here. You've got your WAN. You've got all your sites hanging off it with all your users. You've got your data center here. You've got your internet out here. And this time, yeah, we'll, we'll just stick with AWS. You're starting to build out services in here. There may be web services. You may start to use Active Directory out there. You may start looking at the technologies that I'm talking about later on with VDI and RAS. The other option is effectively dedicated circuits, uh, a layer two circuit into the cloud provider. What does that mean? Is that you could go to a telco and what they will do is they will provide you a physical circuit You've got the VGW you had previously. So you go into AWS, you've split up a VPC or whatever cloud entity you, you want. What you'll do is the telco will provide a dedicated circuit from your data center to the cloud. Um, things that say with AWS, the name for that is Direct Connect. If that was in uh, Azure, Microsoft, that would be an express route. Um, I think Oracle is Fast Connect and, and Google. All the cloud providers have got that. So it's a way of connecting privately. It means that your internet estate out here and your internet circuits, you're not putting extra load on there. You're not traversing the internet. So some pros and cons here. Pros, it's private. You're not going across the internet whatsoever. Number two, um, you're going to get an SLA with that. Because it's private connectivity through a telco, um, you can connect straight to your fabric and it's always on, on, on net. It never leaves so that they can control and give you performance-based uh, access on that. Now, some of the downsides of this is that it is going to cost. You are going to have to probably buy a router here. You are going to have to sign up for um, maybe 12 months minimum contract. Uh, and depending on the bandwidth, it could be a uh, requirement you may want down to 50 meg up to 10 gig. It could be quite expensive. So there's a the cost implications on that. And also with that, because you're, you're going more to moving to traditional tel telco, it's going to take time. Uh, one of my previous clients uh, to get a direct connect from a data center that's well known to the UK government to get to Azure, um, it took nine months and it cost 400,000 pound to run. 
it was a big bearer, yeah. But the timescales were just unacceptable and the costs to get this up and running. One downside of this is you're pretty much putting all eggs in one basket. More and more we're seeing nowadays um, is it just in general is multi-cloud. Is a few years ago you used to you pretty much jumped into bed with either Microsoft or or AWS because people were finding the feet and they they all had a decent offering. Now over the years and everything's maturing, um, you can have best of breed. So say for example, uh, Microsoft with end user and compute services and Active Directory, that they're very good at doing that. And I would say that they're probably best of breed of that. Whereas development, may pe- people may want to move towards AWS for machine learning and analytics. Google have got a very good platform. So now, effectively, you can take best of breed across all of your estate uh, and having a, a, a unified network. It doesn't really matter where those um, services are. So what we're finding is a lot of multi-cloud. If you went down this model, you would find that you're pretty much locked in to, you may need multiple uh, versions of this multiple circuits so if you've got a workload in aws you'd have to get a direct connect if you had then had workloads in azure you'd go and have to buy exactly the same things uh, out in azure and same with google if you went on there so whilst you've got it's private it's sla it's flexible bandwidth there's cost time and sort of complexity um considerations with that saying that if you've got all your eggs in one basket and, and you're just going to go to AWS or any of the cloud providers, never change from that. This is a viable route where you've got the private connectivity, you've got the SLA. Yes, you're tied in, but if you're not looking at going anywhere else, this is a viable option. I'm going to talk now, number three, which is close to my heart because it's, it, it's what Cloud Gateway does, but this is not going to be a, a sales prep whatsoever. There are other vendors out there. Not many. So number three, we're going to start again. You've got your one here. You've got all your sites on there. You've got your data centers there. You've got the internet there. Uh, And over here, we're going to to stick with AWS. Um, What we've built as Cloud Gateway is a hybrid cloud connectivity fabric. So effectively, what it means that we can do is we're completely agnostic on how people connect to us. So say, for example, you're in a data center there. Uh, if you're on one of our campuses, you can plug in there and you've got a straight data center cross-connect in there. If you're not on our campus, you can do like method number one as a tactical measure, VPN across the internet. So you've got a secure VPN to our fabric. Then what we can do is connect to AWS. And this takes about five minutes to connect to AWS. Again, it's a direct connect. If you then decide, I want to start taking Azure, we can do that in about five minutes and connect to your fabric and your tenancy. If you're a private, uh, if you're a public sector organization, you may want to connect privately to the public services network, or if you're the NHS supplier, the health and social care network. All of these are on net and on-prem. So effectively what you've got out here is the users out here, you connect through your data center to Cloud Gateway, or as a third party incumbent, we can create a network to network interface. These are just a multiple ways of connecting to our fabric. And then on from there, you can connect to AWS and Azure. You can connect to AWS out in Singapore. You can connect to Azure out in North America. All take about five minutes. So the, the, there are platforms out there um, not so unique as Cloud Gateway, but there are methods that you can do this sort of connectivity. So connecting your estate in multiple ways to connect to the uh, the uh, cloud fabrics. So pluses, it's it's extremely quick. Start with this data center cross connect can that can take five minutes to do. Data center cross connect seventy two hours. NNI with a, an incumbent can take a week. It's private. So you can get an SLA. It's flexible that you can start on maybe, I want 50 meg here, day one, but ramping up to 500 meg thereafter. Um, Very, very easy to do. Uh, And effectively, it's the reason why it's low cost is that it's taking networking into cloud consumption model, which is pretty much unheard of. Downsides, 
Um, it will be more expensive than just doing a VPN straight to the cloud. Um, so there's the class, class implications, and it all really is really down to your use case. Uh, we have organizations that have got very complex network infrastructure. Um, we, we tend to be able to remove all the compliance and all the security to stop appliance sprawl uh, so that not having to put uh, firewalls in all these environments. Uh, but it all is a, a case of right tool for the right job. If you've just got a very small use case where <coughs> you've got 10 users and you want to augment your estate and you're just kicking the tires, you're dipping your toe in the water to see what you can do within cloud, what services you can migrate, what services you can enhance your existing one. You know what? Right tool, right box, costs you next to nothing uh, and you can do that immediately. Again, horses for courses. One thing I would say about using these mechanisms, regardless of any provider, is the egress charges. Data egress. A lot of people forget about this. If you move data from the cloud out to the internet or out across a direct connect or express route, you can pay nine cents per gig of data, or depending on how you do it, two cents per gig. We've got special ways that we can get it down to one cent per gig. You will pay data egress charges. There's no getting away from it, um, but just be wary that you get these data charges at the bottom of your AWS or Azure or Google bill. Um, there's no getting away from it. That's all I'm just warning that if you've got large amounts of data, it's actually cheaper, uh, best TCO um, to actually do the private connection, move data this way that's at two cents, rather than move the same amount of data hit this way at nine cents. So in summary, three ways of connecting your existing estate out to the cloud. Internet VPN, it's quick, run your own network, but you're at the mercy of the internet performance and no SLA, you can get up and running. Type number two, dedicated circuits to your cloud provider. Whether that be a direct connect, if you're AWS, Express Route Azure, I think that's a, a VLAN connection, can't remember the name of it, but they're all exactly the same provisioning to all the different cloud providers. Again, benefits, it's private, it's an S, you'll get an SLA with it, and you can increase from 50 meg up to 10 gig and more. Downsides, it's a very costly option. Depending on where you are in your data center, it can take a long time because you're at the mercy of a traditional sort of telco. And the downside of this is that if you've got multiple clouds, you're going to have to take multiple connections uh, and worry about dealing with multiple providers to connect those um, end, uh, end clouds. Option number three is various um, transit overlay and security providers and hybrid cloud, cloud platforms like Cloud Gateway connect to us data center cross connect NNI across the internet but it means that you can connect to any cloud provider anywhere in the world within five minutes with a massive security wrapper around here with a full UTM stack with antivirus anti-malware firewall and deep packet inspection uh, and offload to seam integration this is quick it's agnostic on how you connect from your enterprise into the cloud it's all private doesn't go across the internet unless you're going to go this way to start with. It's flexible, plug and play, disconnect, go from 50 meg to 500 meg, do whatever you want. And it's cloud consumption based modeling. The downside again is yes, it will cost more than an internet VPN. But if your strategy is to have multiple clouds, uh, the scalability, lose and um, disaggregate some of your services and stop appliance sprawl on here, um, it is a security wrapper uh, centralized that way. So those are the three main architectures or three of the architectures, uh, the common ones that we come across when connecting your estate to the cloud. Now, I'm going to have a breather. And then on the next set of slides, I'm going to draw out, right, I've connected to cloud. Brilliant. How is this going to help with my business continuity? What are the sort of things that I can do once I'm in the cloud that can help my business continuity, my future proofing, my disaster recovery, uh, getting people to work from home uh, as COVID lockdown two comes along um, type things. And some of the use cases that we've helped um, large corporations and the NHS do over the last sort of six months. So just bear with me a second.
Right. I've got to cloud. Brilliant. What I'm going to do. So we'll just take your, this is effectively down here. This is your estate. We've connect to cloud through a black box method. It could be cloud gateway. It could be the VPN. It could be the direct connect exactly that I've just drawn in those three architectures. So I've moved into AWS. <laughs> I've just picked AWS because it's off the tip of my tongue. So number one, Ooh, which one should we do? Could do that one, that one, or that one. Right. Let's do VDI or desktop as a service, whichever you want you to talk, talk about it. Uh, uh, uh. That's connected to the internet. So what we've done uh, and some of the stuff that you can do within any sort of cloud provider is build out your VDI farm, your virtual desktop interface, uh, infrastructure, desktop as a service. So it's effectively... Um, providing users to come in across the internet, connect securely to a desktop where they can do all the work as if they were acting as if they were on-prem, uh, on the network, working from the office. So, benefits of doing this. So what we're going to do is, in AWS, their, their, work, uh, their VDI solution is called Workspaces. Uh, and it's basically desktop as a service. And what you can do in there is spin up an AWS VPC. We've connected back to your estate. And what it means is you can spin up desktops here that you can lock down. If you've got Active Directory here, you can tie that with your on-prem Active Directory. And what it means is this is a true, true bring-your-own device. And it could be a horrible, horrible non-corporate device. One of the problems that we had at the start of COVID is trying to get 30,000 NHS users to work from home. Now, I'd say a small minority had um, <coughs> had corporate uh, machines. So they were given a laptop. Um, it was fully under the control of the, of, the, uh, of the NHS. So all the patching, all the VPN clients or everything on there. So it was fully locked down. The problem was, is they were trying to get a lot of people to work from home that didn't have those corporate devices. And as it is nowadays, pretty much everybody's got a mobile device of some sort at home that's not a corporate. So what we're trying to do is find a very, very secure way to leverage any um, device, whether it be a, a tablet, steal your kid's iPad, whatever you want, or bring down your old laptop that you found in the loft that you've not touched, that you've dusted off, that's got Windows 2000 on there or something. And we want to figure out a secure way that we could do that. VDI does that. So effectively what you've done, you've got your Windows 2000 PC out the laptop, out the, out the loft. What that does is there's a client that gets installed. And what you do is you go across the internet and you connect securely to that virtual desktop. This is effectively the world's longest HDMI or VGA cable, depending on how old you are. It's using AWS's internet. It's using the cloud's internet. So you're not putting extra strain on the internet within your data center. You're keeping it away from that because you may need, need people to come in and out from other services. So you're taking the load off your estate, and that's one of the important things of this, is that if you're going to augment, um, are you doing it in the right way that you're not having to upgrade and start worrying about overconsumption on your estate here? So all it is is think of it as a window into the desktop. And this desktop out here, it can be locked down and it could have a Cloud Gateway logo on there. It's got all the apps and tools that are on there. What that means, as I said, it's secured across the internet. It's a VDI session. It's a long VGA cable. You cannot download or you can configure it that from here, you cannot download stuff onto this local machine. Because you've got a full protocol break down the middle, you've got a big air gap between this horrible smelly Windows machine and your infrastructure. That really means it truly is bring your own device. Not bring your own device as long as it's up to a certain spec and this, that, and the other. It truly is bring anything that you've got out there that is capable of running uh, this client on here. It also moves into the whole zero trust network access that you've got uh, the air gaps between um, your inside and the outside. 
So effectively, once they're on this desktop, it's a long HDMI cable from their machine onto that desktop. Once you're on that desktop, that you're authenticated with Active Directory. So it's the same username and password that they would be on site. All the apps are published onto the desktops there that they would be as if they're on their laptop or workstation in the office. And if they need to access services, they can come down there and access services in the data center here. So it's a way of getting people in from the outside where it truly is bring your own device. Um, <coughs> things to consider is the reason why it's quite good to use it in the cloud is number one, cost. In the business continuity scenario, you may want to have everything turned off. You can, prov you can provision zero users, but it's all set up, ready to rock and roll. That if we have a COVID lockdown too, when you get everybody to work from home, you can press a button and suddenly you've got 500 desktops available. Pay for what you use. If there's nobody using it, I won't say it's going to cost zero because it will cost you something to have a, a minimal infrastructure, but it's turned off. If all hell breaks loose and business continuity in a panic, you need 500 desktops, you start on five and then you ramp up to 500. You know what? It's pay as you go as you're moving on there and you can scale out and scale in as much as you want. So you're only paying for it when you use it. Another benefit of doing this is that you're not bothered about what happens on the desktop here because it's just all it is is just a conduit to bring you along cable is the audit and the governance and control around who's doing what, what patches are applied, is it updated? Are you having to bring people in to try update um, packages across the internet over a VPN? Do they have to come on site to have all the patches updated? It's a lot easier to control a vanilla desktop that you can uh, update constantly to make sure that everything's in place. And because you've got the air gap, you can see what traffic is coming inbound and outbound. We've got a mechanism here where if we, it was a cloud gateway instance is that we have all traffic going to the internet through us and our secure web gateway features where we can do URL filtering and TLS intercept so that if they come in this way, they can access services here. But if they want to go browsing through there, they can go to the internet, but we've got all the security to ensure that they're not downloading malware onto the boxes, making sure that they're only going to URLs and sites and services on the internet that they're permitted to do as part of their policy. So that's VDI. Pay for what you use. Um, all cloud providers have got a mechanism. <coughs> Controllable. It really is bring your own device. It's not bring your own device with caveats. So you can use it on a laptop. I can connect to my virtual desktop on my Android phone. I can steal my kid's iPad and I could do the same. It can be on a, on a workstation, on a corporate machine or not. You're taking your load off your network because all the traffic back and forth is across here. Uh, and it's scalable from zero to 500 pretty much instantly. Pay for what you use. In a normal scenario, we've seen people spin the infrastructure up, get everything working, and then turn it all off. So effectively, it's business continuity as a service when you need to press the button. So that's VDI and desktop as a service. Scenario two is um, very similar, but some nuances. Mm -mm -mm. So what we've got down here, we've got your data centers, we've got your WAN going out to the internet. <laughs> Again, black box solution, any mechanism you want. And we're going to stick with AWS. It could be any cloud provider, makes no real odds. Is what we're going to look at here is number two, is we're going to look at RAS, or um, sometimes known as, as, as client VPN. As I mentioned previously, um, when COVID kicked off and we were making everybody work from home, there was quite a lot of people that uh, were working out on the internet uh, and there was a couple of uh, major constraints. Is the internet circuits that you provisioned from your data centers um, to the internet were, were maxing out. So that was an issue there. Even if you did have the bandwidth on there, the likeliness is if, if you're on hardware, your VPN hardware, um, uh, probably wasn't built or if you, you were very lucky with a decent network architect to be able to cater for 100% concurrency people working from home. Secondly, we came across a lot of issues where the hardware was fine, but they were licensed to say 500 users, but they had 800 users working from home. 
is that they had to go out and buy 300 more licenses uh, at great cost. So what we're doing in this is instead of building out and augmenting your infrastructure here, that where if you're buying tin and you're buying circuits, it's pretty long lasting. Um, you ramp up with COVID uh, or whichever scenario you've got, business continuity, and then it all dies down. You are left with a hefty bill that um, you've got a lot of wastage thereafter. You've bought 800 licenses, but the norm is 300. You're sat wasted. This is a reason why you go with cloud technology and cloud cost commercial aspects so that you can basically get as pay as you go um, or pay as you need as best you can. So again, on this, what we're going to do in here is build out a large RAS farm, so a remote access service. <coughs> we, there's, there's multiple ways of doing this. Um, you can go and build your own network virtual appliances out here. So you might go with uh, Cisco with their AnyConnect product. You could go with uh, Zscaler. Uh, with their product in there. You could go with Fortigate or any sort of network virtual appliance where there's, there's RAS clients on there. And effectively what that means is you could use a corporate device. Now, this is the difference between this and the VDI is that if we do a VPN in the traditional manner to the estate here, there's no air gap. It's not a long HDMI cable. It's actually this machine now is attached at a network level to your infrastructure and the rest of your estate. So on here, you don't want people with the Windows 98 machines full of vulnerabilities and viruses, because it means that those, if you don't have the appropriate security behind that, they're on your estate once they've connected. So this is a good use of, um, not for the true to bring your own device, it's bring your own device up to a certain caveat, as in it must be of a certain spec and virus patched, or this is a way of using corporate devices, but augmenting it um, in a need it now basis. So it's connected here. It could be an IPSEC VPN or an SSL VPN. It's effectively a secure tunnel from that laptop into your infrastructure here. Now there's these ways of doing it. Um, we do it a different way in Cloud Gateway. We actually use um, OpenVPN. We do a lot of stuff with government. So the reason why we do that is government like to see, they don't like closed technology. OpenVPN, whilst it's a commercial product uh, and licensable product, um, you can get the open source variant of that. So you can actually see in the libraries. So it's the whole open source versus closed is that if you've got a closed party, say, for example, Cisco, it's just Cisco engineers and developers that work on it. Um, whereas in the open community, uh, open source, you've got 10,000 eyes looking at it and it's, it, it's perceived as a, uh, a more honest and um, easy to see. But that's a, uh, that's a chat for another day. Effectively, again, same with the VDI, is that you can start with zero users or ramp up to 5,000 plus or 10,000 plus. And it's when you need them, you can ramp up to run this out again. All traffic will be backing down here off it's with cloud gate where we break out the internet with all the security wrap around there now the way that we do it in the different licensing is that say for example you've got 10,000 potential users that may need to use this at some point the variables are up in the air if you want with the others um, other mechanisms or, or other standards out there the likeliness is that you're going to have to scale and buy 10,000 users, it's going to be costly. The way that we do at Cloud Gateway our, or OpenVPN do some of the licensing, it depends on, on, on your licensing relations that you've got, is that you, you could have 10,000 potential users that could use this at some point. But the way that we do it is you pay for the concurrent. So if you know there's 10,000 potential out there, but at any one point, you know that the likeliness is that maybe 150 users are going to be connected back to your infrastructure at any one point because it's full of the sun. Um, people do different shifts. Uh, people do different roles. Um, people are out and about. They're not at the PCs eight hours a day. There may be road warriors doing sales and they all log in. If you do that, you only pay for the 150 license. So you can roll out the client as many times as you want you only pay for the number of people that are connected at any one point. 
from business continuity perspective, that's pretty uh, that's pretty useful to have. Is that you're not having to worry as long as you've got the infrastructure there that you can turn this on, spin it up, and you can have everybody connected and augment. And these services are in place that just can sit there doing nothing with the lights turned off, and people can connect to come in this way already. It, we've seen in the or in the past we we end up doing this for customers where you know what they've swept the asset it's coming to the end of the life and because people are working from home more they're moving to cloud first agendas internet first agendas they don't really want to spend more money on hardware for another sort of three years that they don't know what's going to happen in cloud we're moving to this cloud model and we actually migrate to this anyway and then connect back to the legacy um, applications that are required there so pros and cons of this again <coughs> applications can be accessed within here or it's used as a, a jump expansion point to come back into your estate so that's real raz clearly differential from clearly different from vdi is that it needs to be a relatively trusted device here licensing is going to be considerably cheaper than vdi because you can have the windows licenses uh, and various things but it's still got the same scalability from zero to five thousand instantly with linking in with Active Directory for all your accounts um, or any of that resource. It's, it's very scalable, but you, you, it's not a truly bring your own device that you can bring any old muck out the loft. So those are two ways of doing that. Another way, slightly bit left field, is web application firewall. So again, let's start again. You've got your data centers down here. You've got your WAN and your estate. Again, you've got your black box solution on how you're going to do your connectivity. Uh, and we, uh, you know what? No, let's go Azure this time. So Microsoft don't feel left out. Again, internet here. Come that way. Internet back to the using Microsoft's internet. Quite a lot of applications nowadays are web-based, um, whether it be uh, sort of internal or external. So quite a lot of it, things like <coughs> you could be on your Salesforce and you could be your internal um, um, CRM products. You could be um, internal web, uh, web portals and various things like that. A lot of common applications are provided over HTTPS within your web browser. And that's going to happen more and more as we move to wrapping even applications that generally um, want to be transported securely. Um, we use a, a TLS wrapper. So effectively, we're encrypting payload end to end. Uh, and a common way of doing that is with a TLS wrapper, SSL. <coughs> um, so it's a way of presenting things through web browsers uh, and over port 443. But that's a little bit too technical. So in this one, is it's a way of, right, how do we get applications that the users known internally how do we present them to the outside world the internet securely in a way that there's a bit of an air gap and a way that we don't have to worry about vdi because it's too costly or complex or we don't have the skills or ras we don't have enough users to warrant that or there's complexity around sort of compliance and governance how can we publish the application to the internet securely and the way that we can do that is is WAF. So effectively, what we can do, we can we can either post it uh, at the front door, which is what we do with a, a large insurance company, where we protect all their e-commerce platform at the front door. Exactly doing that is providing the um, e-commerce platform securely to the internet uh, from their internal networks. Or you could go away and build it in the cloud provider of choice. And effectively, what that means is that you could host applications here. So I'm just going to call this web app. It could be absolutely anything. Or it could be web app on-prem here. So ordinarily, is you've got users here. You would go across the WAN, hit your data center, hit your application that way. All well and good. In my web browser, uh, job logs can um, log in, do their work, and away we go or they may have migrated that. They have moved to the cloud because you've got all the auto scale and the scalability that you've got and, and take advantage of some of the native constructs that you've got within cloud providers. So it could be in any way for any way that way. Again, in that scenario, come out the site from the web browser, go across the platform and hit the web app that, that way. At this point, everything is 
on net. It's on prem. It's internal. In a bit of continuity as a service and, and business and a DR perspective, is this may not be here, or this may be saturated, or you may have issues, or like I mentioned before, you don't have a VPN clients. You can present that application securely out to the WAF. And what does that mean? Is that a user can be out on the internet and log in, go to that URL here, and DNS will point you that way. Effectively, what you've got then is a protocol break, sometimes known as a reverse proxy. But what that means is you can create a secure tunnel from the laptop, and it's exactly the same the way that banks do now. If you go to your first direct or HSBC, you'll see the padlock in the web browser. You know that that's end-to-end secured and encrypted. We're doing exactly the same here. So it's encrypted, so nobody's going to be able to spy into that. What that does mean is on the WAF, you can decrypt that. So known as SSL offload. And what that means is once you broke the packet apart, the WAF <coughs> is able to run all of the things, and we can do it in this way here, run it all through a UTM and a, uh, and a WAF. So is it checking? Are they trying to run viruses down there? Are they trying to run some sort of exploit on your backend SQL database? Uh, are you using an old version of Apache on this web app here that is exploitable? And because we can break apart that, we're protecting and creating an air gap and ensuring that you know what is going on inside that payload. Because if it's encrypted end to end, you can't get inside uh, and see what's going on because it's encrypted, the whole nature of that. With a WAF, you can break it apart, see what's going on inside the payload, apply a security policy. Then a new session is established from the WAF to the web app on your behalf. So there's actually two sessions in play here. Let's change colors. We've got a session from here to the front end of the WAF, then goes through all the security. Uh, that pen's not gonna work. Then you've got a session from the back end to the web application there. So it's a bit of an air gap. You can apply a lot of security uh, to that and you can ensure that you, are, you can make that application accessible from the internet um, quite securely. Again, if you take um, the, some of the constructs within cloud, those are pretty much infinitely scalable. You can publish multiple applications. You can publish back to a, a load balancer that may have hundreds of applications at the back end. It's a way of a single point of presenting your applications to the outside world with a very small internet surface area that if you've got UTMs and everything in the way, you can see what is going on and protect it. Lastly, the web app doesn't necessarily have to be there. To set up a WAF on TIN, if you bought TIN and WAFs in your data center, they are tens of thousands of pounds to get something decent because they're doing quite a lot of inspection at the application layer. It's not a simple layer three, four firewall. Um, you could, so that's a good reason to actually have that in the cloud there. But just because the WAF and the presentation is at the front door and using Microsoft's internet front end, if you've got these things in place, that application could still be on the data center. So in the time of crisis, everybody continues to work in the data center out of the tin that you've got in your data center campus, but you're presenting it out to the outside world, the exact same app, nothing changes, maybe just a URL change. You might have split DNS, nothing may change, there's ways around that. So it's effectively, you connect to the WAF at the front door here, and it can connect locally to the web app or to the back end or with WAF, because you've got different pools, that WAF can host web app number one down here, web app number two down here. For develop environments, which um, I know happens a lot, is that um, Dave has got a laptop under his desk that's running uh, app number three that he wants to publish to the outside world. Um, if you really want to do that, you could publish it to the outside world, and the back end will talk to Dave's laptop under his machine that's doing his de development environments. So that's the third and final sort of uh, mechanism of publishing stuff out to the internet to, to augment your estate. So I've rushed those through those three. So just a quick recap. VDI, true bring your own device, air gap between uh, uh, your infrastructure and the outside world. It's a HDMI cable effectively to the front door. Again, cloud commercial model, pay for what you use, turn it off, need a thousand users, turn it on, thousand users there. 
Raz, slightly different. Um, bring your own device, if up to a certain spec, corporate device, they're connected to your network directly, not through a VDI. Pros and cons of that, licensing uh, and cost models. The way that we do it is you're not paying for how many licenses out there, you're paying for the concurrent users. Um, so uh, very similar access and providing that, um, but slight nuances. And then WAF, Web Application Firewall, presenting your internal applications outside where you don't want to do VDI for whatever reason, or you don't want to do RAS for whatever reason there. And it's a good mechanism of publishing to third parties in the outside world um, from, from your applications out on your estate, on your legacy estate. With all these models, it can be very flexible. Bring stuff, tech stuff out to cloud, bring it back in. You can have a hybrid model uh, in each of that. So that's my presentation. I thank you very much for, um, uh, for attending, for listening. And I do believe there is a, you can ask questions somewhere and I'm desperately looking for where to be able to do that. There is a questions and answer um, box attached to this Zoom. Uh, a couple of questions that I've had directly. Uh, what challenges, what challenges are in setting this infrastructure and what skills required? With all of these, as I mentioned at the start, is that network is a dying art. With a lot of these, the cloud providers will help you connect fairly seamlessly to a certain level. With complex network infrastructure, skill sets, networking, you are going to need a, a network skill set. There's no ways around it if you've got a complex environment. Uh, it's a bit of a dying art. Um, but the way that we do it at Cloud Gateway is because we've built the fabric and, and the all the network and we're taking all that heavy lifting for you. So we just basically need a, a few details from either side and we will help you and work with that. So you are going to need some sort of skill sets. Obviously, within the cloud, you're going to need cloud skill sets. Um, networking in the cloud is an art that I've been trying to understand for the last three years uh, and it is difficult. And there's not one cloud provider that is identical to the other regarding networking. So the advantages of, say, for example, a cloud gateway, it removes that abstraction, it abstracts the need to understand all cloud platforms and your legacy cloud platform and your legacy networking regarding routing and security. Um, if you've got multiple cloud providers, you will have to learn networking in Azure, networking in Google, networking in AWS. It is difficult and um, not going to lie, everyone's different. It would be nice if they all played nicely and all had the same sort of constructs, but they don't. It's getting to that way. We've done the heavy lifting for our customers so that they don't have to worry about the infrastructure, and we've made it very easy that we can do this connectivity, spin one up in, in, in a couple of hours, and the, the headache of the networking side is done because it's all of our – it's basically what we've built Cloud Gateway on and our skill sets uh, with all of us. Uh, 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 uh. What are the risks need to take into consideration when migrating to cloud? Um, that's quite a broad question, to be honest. There are risks. Everybody thinks that cloud is secure by default. It can be. There's no question. It can be. All the cloud providers give you a massive lot of tool, uh, tool sets to make it secure. People are still, there's quite a lot of people still in the old wave. I want to go to a data center that I know has got a lock on the front door. They want to go in there and they just want to be able to touch something that's LED and they think that that's secure. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it not necessarily is secure. One thing that people do fall down with regarding sort of security, and I'm talking sort of resilience and integrity within the cloud, is <coughs> that shared responsibility model. Is that out the box, if you spin up something in Azure, uh, a Windows box, you can connect that to the internet. It is automatically connected. You can RDP to it, and so can everyone else in the world connect to that. And people out in Russia can connect that. If you've not locked it down, you are, you're asking for trouble. So whilst all the cloud providers give you the tools, you need to understand on how to implement those tools. Do I think it's more secure <clears throat> than a data center? I'm getting to the point where it is. I think it is, but you need to know what you're doing. That's why I 
truly, truly recommend that you have IT health checks uh, and you get your stuff pen tested and, and you come up with your compliance and, govern- uh, and governance and your guardrails for your developers and your infrastructure teams to, to work within. I'd say the risks are primarily around security and understanding how traffic routes within the cloud. There's also other risks as well, is that cloud providers will say, hey, it's the damn site cheaper. Um, you really have to look at the TCO over a number of years. Um, we're coming across some big organizations that are repatriating. Um, they drank the Kool-Aid, went with providers, put everything in the cloud, and then realized stuff like the data egress charges. Um, getting those data egress charges out, getting data out, that costs a fortune. Um, storage, if you have hot storage, um, it's quite expensive. So over a, a, a three-year period, you might find that, you know what, cloud isn't that all be all and end all. However, having a hybrid infrastructure uh, and having the connectivity there and the, even having the options there to spin something up and spin something down, it means that you can go, you know what, my storage, I've invested a, a load in, in, in storage and, and, and on my SAN and all my, my hypervisors and my data center. I'm going to use that, but I want a little bit of security and, and a bit of WAF and a bit of RAS. I don't want to buy tin. It's just cheaper to, to augment and build that in the cloud and back in. We've seen that that, that shift, uh, and it's coming to a sort of a bit more of a natural equilibrium about the cost thing of it actually makes sense because I need the agility. Now, I guess, again, with agility, if things are more expensive in the cloud, but you can effect change and you can enable services a load quicker, there's got to be some intangible benefits of or having the premium of being able to spin it up. As Cloud Gateway, if we had to buy all of our infrastructure that we've built in the cloud in our data center purely on data center tin, it would be into the tens of millions of pounds. As a company startup, four-year-old, we didn't have that money. Um, so we, we see the benefits of, of picking the best and knowing when to go on-prem and when to go in the cloud. But to get where we are today, we had to build everything in cloud because we need the agility to be able to build a platform anywhere we go. Now, ourselves internally, we're readdressing that balance and we're getting the best of breed of physical and the best of breed of, uh, of networking uh, in the cloud. So those are the two main things is, uh, for me is cost and security. I do have more questions coming in. However, I do understand that we're a couple of minutes away um, from the end of uh, the scheduled um, time. So number one, I sincerely thank you for everyone for listening to me rant for the last hour. Um, you've got my details on there. Um, uh, feel free to take a look at the Cloud Gateway website about what we do and how we could help you. Or even at best, a not Cloud Gateway sell. There's a lot of snake oil being sold at the moment regarding hybrid connectivity, cloud connectivity and security. Um, I love to have a chat with my peers, even if it's got nothing to do with Cloud Gateway please pick up the phone and have a conversation, buy me a coffee virtually or otherwise to run ideas past me um, because we've stopped a lot of organizations, large and small, from making unnecessary um, changes in architecture for the wrong reasons. There's, There's horses for courses. We can help out. So please use me as a sounding board or anyone at CloudGate. We'll be more than happy to have a chat. We don't want to see anyone advised, ill-advised in certain ways of doing things. So on that note, you've got my details. Go to cloudgateway.co.uk. Um, we're up for a chat at any point. Uh, I do believe that this has been recorded, so I'm sure we'll put it on our website if we've missed anything or you need your colleagues to take a look at. So lastly, Thank you very much for for listening and watching and I hope to speak to you uh, very soon and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.